Three year old when you first started working. Yeah, it was it was quite a culture shock, uh, to be honest. Uh, <coughs> I just finished cramming four years of college into four and a half years, and um, my college was uh, really focused on. Uh, I would say building relationships. <laughs> um, that's the professional way of saying just having a good time. Um, very social, love <laughs> being with people. You know, you're, you're in a great environment in the college town of Waco. This is pre-football in Waco. So we, uh, uh, we found lots of other things to have fun with. And now I'm coming to work in a suit, you know, trying to emulate my dad, who I saw as a banker forever. And uh, I'm going to work with a bunch of basically my dad's, <laughs> a bunch of older men, um, whom I've realized that one of the beauties of being uh, an older man is that you just seem to plateau, because you look the same. Um, and I know I've aged, and Mark Schwartz, you look the exact same, minus the mustache. Uh, yeah, and so I'm coming into this environment as a 23-year-old who's going, ah, oh. you know, when the alarm goes off, I go, what classes do I have today? Oh, wait, it's work. <laughs> It's work again um, every single day, and uh, it's a completely new identity, right? It's, I'm, it's no longer college and fraternities and sororities and intramurals and fun. It's professional, and uh, you know, getting dressed up is not ripped jeans and boots every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, as we've talked, you've shared a little bit of some of those tensions that you experienced. In making this adjustment into the work world, tell us tell us a little about that. Sure, absolutely. And and you know when you're first coming out of college, thinking back to your whole identity structure and where does my value come from and where does uh, where am I not just making an impact, but where where is this value coming? And in our career, commercial real estate, um, really you. There's a big, big scoreboard, right? And the scoreboard is how much production are you doing? How much money are you bringing in? Um, we even had in our office, you know, uh, kind of a motivator tool. It was, you know, you put ribbons quarterly on the doors of the offices of the top producers, right? And you had your number one ribbon, your number two ribbon, your number three. And so you had this visual reminder of, wow, here is value. These guys are making money. These guys are making big money. And uh, I'm trying to wrestle through that tension of, of where does my value come from and um, you know, also being liked in an office. It's a completely different thing now. Going to lunch is like the big social every day um, and trying to go to lunch with men who have careers that are established and families and wives and I'm just dating and having a blast doing that and uh, they have children and sporting events and things to go to. So that creates some anxiety as you were in that kind of environment coming out of college? Yeah, sure. It definitely just it created kind of a crisis of, uh, of, of value, of really, hey, what is this all about? What am I all about? And I'll never forget thinking about that in one of my training sessions, being the new guy, the college grad. Um, not to put him on the spot, but I, I, I'm talking with Mark here, and I'm... He runs the office and I'm like, you know, I'm really struggling with is, is really my value, how much money I'm making? Like, it seems so empty, it seems so pointless. And the wisdom that God gave you that you passed on to me was, you know, maybe it's not how much money a man makes that is his value, that is his worth, but it's what he does with that money. And kind of this light switched on again. And, and I, a little background on me, I was very fortunate to be born into a family where my mother and father both came to know Christ before I was born, um, but right before I was born. And so I saw them always seeking the Lord, seeking his purposes. And so I'd, I'd had a good foundation, a good base of understanding my dad with a right understanding of money and that it's not ours and, and we should be generous. But then that really flipped that light bulb on of realizing, you know, what are your priorities set on? What are you really investing in? Because I'd had some tastes of things of this world and it was really empty. Or it was fun and then it wasn't fun anymore. You know, the newness wore off and so that's really turned a light bulb on of what are you investing your life in? And uh, that, that's about the same time around then or shortly thereafter that God gripped my heart and just really compelled me to volunteer at, uh, at, at the church my parents' church, I wouldn't even really call it my own, but that I kind of went to 
um, he really compelled me to go and volunteer in the youth group and to start stepping out of my comfort zone to invest in other people's lives and to me it felt natural to the closer age bracket to me were freshmen in high school than the men I was working with <laughs> at that time. I mean, freshmen in high school were closer to me than yeah the guys I was uh, going to lunch with and wearing a suit trying to look like. Yeah, and you and I had the opportunity of doing some some things in the morning. So tell us, yeah. tell us what are some of the things that we did together. Yeah, that also that also really helped um, during that first year, first few months. Joe, um, I guess felt the call and uh, acted on it and, and grabbed me and said, hey, I want to start meeting with you. Um, just, to, just to pray in the morning, to go over scripture and uh, to pray for this office. And um, I, I'd gone to private Christian school growing up. I'd gone to Baylor, so I wasn't uh, bashful about being an identified Christian, but I certainly was blurring the lines with the social of of man, am I going to be Sunday Charlie Monday through Saturday, or am I just going to have Sunday Charlie and then Monday through Friday Charlie and then Saturday Charlie and then I've got my Austin friends. But so Joe grabbed me and and we started meeting once a week at, at the horribly early hour of like 6:30, which I thought was like against the law, <laughs> um, but we did. And, and he started challenging me that we're going to do scripture memory, um, and. Uh, challenging me and I thought okay well I can do a couple verses at a time and so I was just kind of doing the easy stuff and um, then he really pushed me and handed me his Bible one day and said open to the book of James I didn't, I didn't know I was going to share this but so open to the book of James and he said you tell me the chapter and verse and I'll say it and so I just said James 4 11 and he thought and then he quoted it and he memorized the book of James and I went okay I'm just kind of doing the bare minimum here. There's a deeper level that I, I want to invest my life in. And we started praying for people in the office. We started walking around the office, and this felt kind of weird to me. But at first, we started walking to people's offices. And we said, hey, let's just pray over Jim's cubicle. Let's pray over John's cubicle. Let's just pray over these people's offices. Like physically getting up and doing that. I'd never done that before, and I thought, okay. I'll follow you, um, and that's what we did. Yeah. And, uh, and, and one of those fellows, you mentioned Jim. Jim was an actual person in our office, so mm -hmm. Jim was probably how much older than you at that time? Let's see, if I'm 23, he's probably 30 years older than me. So, uh, as you mentioned, you related a lot to older people there, and so tell us about your relationship with Jim yeah. and, and how that developed. Yeah, so <laughs> my first... One of my first memories of, of really relating with Jim, other than riding in the car with him to go to lunch, was uh, working late on a proposal. Uh, he was probably working on a proposal, and I was just working on a way to reach out to people to get them to talk to me in business. Um, and uh, I remember going to the bathroom, walking by his cube, and, and he's working on something, and he had a bottle of wine. And uh, I thought, is that allowed? We can drink alcohol in our class? Like, I'm still in the class mindset, like, what? And, and uh, you know, so he offers me a glass of wine, and I thought, okay. And so we had a glass of wine and just talked. Um, and and just he just talked about life. And talked about, uh, he had these, he was into donkeys. <laughs> the weirdest thing. He had this beautiful uh, lake house place and some property, and they, he had donkeys. And we talk about those silly donkeys. And uh, he talked about his kids, and um, we both liked the lake and boats and stuff. And so we just started to connect, kind of in a real way. Uh, Jim's a very, he was a very outgoing, gregarious guy. Never met a stranger, you know, loved, loved people. Loved, uh, I really connected with him in that way because I really loved having a good time, being with people, entertaining. I remember the time we were in Las Vegas together mm -hmm. for a convention with yeah. a company, and I, I, yeah. I share a little bit about the story sure. of you and Jim sure. walking the streets of Las Vegas together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we we had uh, this is goodness. We've been working together for a while now, and Jim had included me in the lunch bunch, um, which I felt really cool about. A bunch of guys and went to lunch, and we give each other a hard time, and I started to see this camaraderie. And so we built up a relationship, and then I had my first business trip ever and we're going out to Las Vegas and it's actually my first time to ever even go to Las Vegas um, so that's exciting and the whole scenes the whole deal and so a bunch of company meetings and then we have a happy hour 
Um, and then Jim and I and some others say, hey, let's go do some gambling and go see Vegas. So we go out to see Vegas and uh, Jim, Jim and I get bored gambling uh, pretty quick. Me, because I've never done it before and I lose all my money. And Jim says, well, let's go, let's go see if we can find a show. And so we go to walk and he just talks his way, talks way in for he and I to walk into the blue man group no tickets nothing just chats the the girl up and then chats her manager up and gets us in front row and we watch the blue man group which I'd never seen before um, it's just incredible fun Vegas and then we leave and it's late but we just start walking the Vegas strip and just start talking and I just asked him hey Jim what do you think about God what do you think about eternity um, because we had a relationship, and that seemed the most important thing to me. Because I've been, you know, this world's kind of empty, and I tasted a lot of this world, and realized it's really empty. And these relationships. Aren't... So we walked the whole Vegas Strip, and he just kind of poured his heart out about all his issues with Christianity and with organized religion and with this and that. And I just listened, and we just talked and asked him questions and. Next thing you know, we looked up and we're like, where are the lights? We walked all the way out of town. <laughs> so we turn around and walk all the way back, talking about it and whatever. And uh, there was no magic. There was no, he, God gave me great words. And all of a sudden, there we are on our knees, accepting Christ, none, nothing like that. It was just an opportunity to connect and uh, for me just to hear him and to tell him that, hey, that's it's okay to have dissenting feelings and emotions and it's okay to have these feelings that God's in charge and God still loves and God still is pursuing you um, yeah. and this is God's work and probably not long after that another fellow in our office by the name of John who also Charlie and I worked on a lot of projects together and I mentored him and uh, there's another gentleman in our office named John and he also teamed up with Charlie on some projects and yeah. he helped mentor you in the in the business world he did uh, did a lot with you and uh, so tell us about your relationship with John sure sure John was a part of the lunch bunch and uh, uh, he had a uh, blended family uh, been divorced and remarried and and uh, John had an amazing amount of salesmanship he had just this gift of gab but a way to move a process forward to walk in a door and um, not just say hello, how are you, and, and maybe get a little bit of information, but to really get in, and he said salesmanship was the best way to, to do it. And I had just had a lot of energy and thick skin and ability to just, you say run through that wall, I'm gonna run through that wall. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm just gonna do it. And I think John saw value in that to be able to leverage his time. So we started working together because I wanted to learn more of the finer arts of his salesmanship and he wanted to leverage his time and use the young guy to go do all the cold calling. And I'll bring back whatever I can find and you help me, help me make sense out of this mess I'm gonna bring back. So we started doing a lot together. I was always in his car and we were always doing, he'd call me up and go run here and I'd do that. And um, then when he took family vacations, um, he'd have me handle his properties for him. Because again, I'm just a single guy and I, every day is kind of, every weekend's a family vacation for a single guy. I'm running around with his running buddies. <laughs> And uh, we don't have schedules or anything like that. Kids get things to do. So John and I started just developing that work relationship together. Um, and uh, I just, you know, spending time with them and, and doing a lot of work and whatnot. And then as our careers progressed, he, he had an opportunity to leave the firm. Uh, and about the same time, I had an opportunity to, to leave the firm and, and go to a corporate job. Um, and he was leaving to go to a different pursuit, still in third party uh, brokerage. And so uh, we stayed in touch and we actually continued to do deals together because now I was strictly a landlord guy and he was a tenant rep guy. And so we just continued our professional career that way. Yeah, and so you continued this relationship with John even though you weren't working in the same office. And, right. And there was a point in time where, I don't know how many years later, but you discovered that John was having a health Help yeah, so seven, eight years later, John is now the head of this big CCIM symposium. And that's like a big event in commercial real estate where everyone gets together and you're kind of the state of the union of the market and everything. And he was the, the head guy over it. And 
really invested months and months and months of time, uh, hundreds of hours into getting ready for it. And uh, he had actually asked me to be the industrial guy and I just totally shunned him. Um, but we had that kind of relationship and that equity at that point where I could say, get someone else, but I'm excited for you. So we'd stayed in touch and uh, I didn't even actually go to the symposium um, that, that he had held. I had actually corporate people in town and whatnot. And uh, then I remember the next day, someone telling me, yeah, I heard John's in the hospital. And I thought, well, that's weird. Uh, Vogel's in the hospital. Um, so I, I called him up and uh, he said, yeah, he'd been having some trouble speaking and he'd been uh, feeling it for a while, but he had to get through this big presentation. <clears throat> so he did, so I went out to meet with him the next day just to see him in the hospital, see how my buddy was doing. And uh, his kids were there and his wife and all, and uh, I'll never forget, I just thought he was in because there was, I didn't know what was going on, right? And we're talking and uh, the doctor comes in and says, hey, we've got a lot of the results back from the scans and everything. And so I said, oh, John, I'll, I'll go ahead step out and he says no okay he goes you stay here I said all right fine and the doctor said hey look this is not good news um, this is bad he goes look this is you've got a brain tumor he goes in this type of brain tumor that I see I see all the time and this is cancer this is this is bad John and uh, I mean talk about feeling like a fish out of water right I'm I'm a coworker, I'm a friend, and there I am. He's got his children, his wife in there, and uh, he just starts, you know, obviously the weight of the world just hits him like a ton of bricks. He just starts sobbing, you know, what do you do? And uh, thank God um, <clears throat> the Lord really just gave me this, uh, he's given me a gift, right? So when I became a Christian, he's always given me a tender heart for mercy. Whether it was growing up with uh, special needs kids, right? Because in high school we were we were forced to get service hours, and so instead of mowing people's lawns, it was easier for me to play with kids and uh, babysit and do special needs respite care at our church. And so, for a reason, God just gave me this compulsion to move forward when someone's in a time of grief. And uh, so I just I did the only thing I needed to do, which was I just went and put my hand on him and uh, just kind of stood there and cried with him didn't know what to do and so he took a deep breath whatever and, and we had that moment with his family of realizing wow okay this is this is life-changing right this is this is huge and then the only other thing I need to do is I don't have any answers I'm at least smart enough to know that I'm not real smart um, and uh, so I just said John let me pray with you because we don't have the answers and we're obviously not in control and uh, so we just pray just a simple prayer and uh, that was kind of the beginning of uh, our walk, you know, through that very, uh, you know, the greatest challenge of his life. So, obviously, that was heavy, heavy news. Mm -hmm. And um, so, how did you and John? How did your relationship develop after yeah. that? After yeah. Such a big. So at that point, John knew. Obviously, I was. I'm identified as a Christian. John knew I'd been involved in youth group work as a volunteer. He knew that I. Matter of fact, he thought you were crazy sometimes for some of the things you could do. Yeah. He did. He did. He even at, at one point had said, "What in the world are you doing, leaving for seven days to take a bunch of kids down to Honduras on a mission trip? Um, like, really, you're going to use your vacation for that? Uh, we, we've got some deals to do. We've got some money to make." And I said, hey, it's all going to work out. And of course, that all, of course, worked out. And uh, he, he was intrigued by it, thought it was interesting. Um, and, and at that point, though, you know, it all really comes down to where, what are you really investing your life in? And at that point, John really reached out to me and said, Charlie, I'm scared. And we had had a close enough relationship where he felt comfortable that he could say, hey, I'm scared. And uh, I said, hey, I am too. I get it. I said, why don't we start meeting? I want to start coming to your house. You know, he, he had some procedures. I go to the hospital for the procedures. And I said, why don't we start meeting? And uh, so we, I started going to his house once a week uh, for about a month. And I took him a Bible. I said, John, I had a Bible. It had his name on it. And I said, I, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I've grown up knowing that this is the truth. This is absolute truth. 
and let's just start reading the Bible. So we started reading the Bible, and, and it wasn't so much reading the Bible as John started working through his childhood, working through his, his life experience with religion, organized religion, his, uh, his hurts from growing up, and I just sat there and listened. Right? I'm, not, I'm not some specially gifted person, uh, super smart guy. I got a D for diploma in college. Um, <laughs> they gave me ones, they just didn't want me on campus anymore. And, and so I just listened, and I listened to him work this stuff out and just keep going back to the Bible and saying, you know, I don't have all the answers, John, but uh, I, I know that this is absolute truth and there's peace and power in the Word of God and knowing that He loves you and there's nothing you can do to make Him love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make Him love you less. And uh, so that was, that was a special time. Mm -hmm. So ha tell us what happened after that. Yeah, so, how, how did this so his tumor started popping up just left, left and right and he had procedures and whatnot, but they weren't working. And, and uh, then um, we'd met for about a month and then uh, he kind of drifted more into focusing on well he was going to the hospital more and, and we couldn't meet a couple times and then I was working on a bunch of things that required me to travel for work so I wasn't in town and then I got some really garbled text messages from him and then I called him and he really wasn't able to speak real well and it'd been a couple months since we last met and so I said okay um, you know reached out to his wife found he was in a rehab center so then I went to the rehab center and saw that it, the disease was really overtaking him at that point. Um, so I would go a couple days a week, uh, three, four, five times, and, and he wasn't getting better. And it, it looked, the doctors finally came in one of the last times I was there and said, hey, look, um, this isn't going to get better. Right? And so we sat there around John, and uh, he was still pretty cognitive. and. Um, and, and his wife told me that, that a couple days before he had been able to communicate to her, um, call Charlie. And uh, so, so she, had, you know, when I showed up, she said, wow, I'm supposed to reach out to you. We need to have a meeting with the doctors. And uh, so with John there, we had me with the doctors talking about hospice, talking about the end of life stuff. You know, she's going to lose her spouse. And then uh, his kids coming in, some from out of town, coming in and having to talk to them about your dad's going to die. Um, and all the time I'm thinking, wow, really? <laughs> Me? Right? I'm, I'm the one doing this? Uh, but, um, you know, God spoke through the whole thing. And, uh, and so we got to, you know, be there to be there and just be with his family as John, you know, took his last breaths and, and passed away. Well, thank you for, for blessing him and for blessing sure. his family and for sharing this. And um, the story really does impact me, and, and it's it's a story worth sharing. So thanks for sharing that. And as you, as let's fast forward now to think about you know every day. I'll, obviously, all of us don't have. Those kinds of things thank God happening every day in our life, but um, but how when you think about being compassionate, caring with people that you interact with today and in your everyday life, what what helps you do that? How, how or what well, things don't help you do that? How do right. you process through that? Yeah, so that you know, I've been in a couple situations like John's situation with other friends who passed away, but as I think, really the one thing I really want to leave you all with is that. Those, those are exceptional situations. And what I've realized in my own life is especially the last five years, I've had a big transition out of corporate America and back into basically owning my own business, um, but being an independent guy. And I found that what's one of the things that really has kept me from practicing compassion, especially the last couple of years, is I put those blinders on and I think, you know what, I've really got to focus on my career really got to focus on my family solely and not deal with all the messy people in my office <laughs> and, and the messy people that are called clients and folks and whatnot. I just need to be transactional based and I get self-centered so to speak. I get kind of selfish and I get my priorities out of whack and I think these are good things I'm going to focus on, right? I'm going to focus on growing this career 
Uh, I'm going to focus on this so I can bless my family and bless, you know, mm-hmm. through tithing and whatnot. But, but then um, I get self-centered. And I think, you know, it's just the everyday things. And I was blessed from you reaching out to have me tell the story again to realign my focus and say, you know what, I do need to be more compassionate myself and pray about opportunities. And then when people ask me questions and I answer them and we start talking about other things, don't be selfish just to give an answer and try to move on. And I got blessed just the other day with a coworker who asked me a question, another identified Christian, and talking about trying to mentor some younger kids that he knows I've done. And so we were able to talk about that. And then I was able to take the next step, which is to say, you know what, I don't have all the answers. Well, let's just pray together. Let's, let me just, let's go in the conference room here at work and let me just pray over you. Because I don't have all the answers. You know, you don't have all the answers, but the most compassionate thing we can do with people is to say, I know someone who does have all the answers. And let's just go to him. You know, and that's just an everyday kind of compassionate thing that we can do to uh, reflect Christ and be part of the story. Good, thanks. Well, <clears throat> you know, we all are in different spheres of relationships that we have, and um, um, obviously, this is a, a very touching story of an extreme situation. But we do, all of us, encounter people who are hurting, who have significant issues going on in their life. And as well as people who just are not sure what their purpose is in life today. And so uh, we're going to have an opportunity now for you just to spend some time with uh, the people at your table and and to brainstorm and ask God to help give you ideas and thoughts of what He would have you do in your particular sphere of caring for those that you interact with, the people that you serve either as maybe a head of a company or maybe an employee of a company or people that uh, you work around and live around uh, and so your table leader is going to uh, has a list of a couple questions to kind of walk through so you can share those together and then we'll we'll uh, in about 10 to 15 minutes we'll come back together and close up